Cambridge IGCSE Physics, February March 2020, Paper 42, Part 2. Question 6, Part A. Figure 6.1 shows crests of a water wave moving from left to right in the harbor. On Figure 6.1, draw dreamer crests to the right of point A. What would happen if the wave travels beyond this wall? One thing for sure, the wavelength will stay the same, and also the crests should still be parallel. However, the crests will be curved a bit at the bottom like this. State the name of the wave process that occurs as the wave passes point A. This is called a diffraction. Part B. Figure 6.2 shows the crests of another wave moving from left to right in a different part of the harbor. This wave moves from deep water to shallow water. If the depth of the water changes, it's refraction. On figure 6.2, draw an arrow to show the direction of movement of the wave after it has passed into the shallow water. The direction of movement of the wave is perpendicular to the crest of wave, like this. So again, our direction will be like this. State the name of the process to the cures as the wave passes into the shallow water. It's refraction. Complete Table 6.1 to say whether each of the properties of the wave increases, decreases, or stays the same as the wave passes into the shallow water. Well, we can always refer to this diagram, it's easy, so the wavelength, this is the wavelength. You can see that it became much smaller, so it decreases. Then the frequency, the frequency remains the same. It's not affected by refraction. For speed, it decreases, well, think about the formula speed equals to frequency times the wavelength. I said that the frequency remains the same and the wavelength decreases, so obviously speed decreases as well. Question 7 Part A Figure 7.1 shows a converging lens and the image I formed when an object is placed to the left of the lens. The principal focuses are labeled A and B and the center of the lens is labeled C. On figure 7.1, draw two rays to locate the position of the object. Draw the object and label it O. First, draw a straight line that connects this part of the arrow, the center point, towards this side of the diagram. Then draw another straight line from the tip of the arrow that passes through B, the focal point, through this lens. Then a horizontal line to the left side. Okay, the rays are done and the intersection is where the object is. Make sure you draw this arrow to indicate that the object is there. Ring all of the following distances that are equal to the focal length of the lens. These are the focal lengths, the distance between the lens and the principal focus. So the answers are AC and CB. Part B, figure 7.2 shows green light passing through a triangular glass block. Red light enters the triangular glass block shown in figure 7.2 along the same path as the green light. On figure 7.2, draw the path of the red light within the triangular glass block. If this is how the green light passed through, how would the red light pass through? Well, red light will go through less refraction, so it will be a bit above the green ray. Figure 7.3 shows green light passing through a rectangular glass block. Red light enters the rectangular glass block shown in figure 7.3 along the same path as the green light. On figure 7.3, draw the path of the red light within the rectangular glass block. Again, it will be refracted less than the green ray, so it's going to be like this. Draw the path of the red light after leaving the rectangular glass block. When it leaves the block, it's going to be parallel to the incident ray. Question 8, figure 8.1 shows a circuit. The lamp has a resistance of 3 ohms. Line XY represents a uniform resistance wire of resistance 6 ohms. Part A. Calculate the reading on the ammeter. To find the reading on the ammeter, we'll have to use the formula V equals to IR or I equals to V over R. The voltage is 12 volts as given here and we need to find the resistance. 
Well, the resistance and the series circuit, you just have to add all of them together. So the total resistance is 6 plus 2 plus 3 equals 2, 11. Then use the formula V over R. 12 divided by 11, it's 1.1 ampere. Part B, figure 8.2 shows the circuit with a different connection to the resistance wire and an added resistor. The length xy of the whole resistance wire is 2 meters. The contact is made at Q where the distance xq is 0.60 meters. Calculate the resistance of the circuit. Well, although not stated here, the resistance of xy was 6 ohms. So we're gonna remember that and state here that it's 6 ohms. But this time, we're only using 0.6 meters of the 2 meter wire. The important point that you need to remember is that resistance of wire is proportional to the length of wire. So to calculate the resistance of XQ, we can say 6 times 0.60 over 2, which is 1.8. Then we need to find the total resistance of the circuit. This is 1.8 here, 1.5. Okay, let's first calculate the resistance of a parallel circuit. It's 1 over R equals to 1 over 1.8 plus 1 over 1.5, which is 11 over 9. So the resistance of the parallel circuit is 9 over 11. Then to find the total resistance, we have 2 and 3 here, so add 2 and 3 to 9 over 11. It's 5.8 rounded to 2 SF. You first need to find the resistance of XQ using that resistance of wire is proportional to length. Then calculate the resistance of the parallel part of the circuit and add up the series part of the circuit. Question 9, Part A. State the name of the logic gate with the symbol shown in figure 9.1. This is a NAND gate. Be careful of the small circle in front. Part B. State the name of the logic gate with the truth table shown in table 9.1. The output is exactly opposite of the input, which means it's a NOT gate. Part C. Figure 9.2 shows a digital circuit. Complete the truth table in table 9.2 for the circuit for all possible combinations of input. First, let's identify which gates are used. This is an OR gate, AND gate, and an AND gate. Now, the inputs A and B go through the OR gate and become C. The outputs are 1, 1, 1, and 0. And for OR gate, the output is always 1, except if the input is 0, 0. So at least we know that the inputs of A and B are 0, 0. Then for AND gate, again, inputs A and B are used as its inputs. We have an output of 1 in the front row, and AND gate produces 1 if both the inputs are 1. So this is 1 and 1. And for the second and third row, it doesn't matter if it's 1, 0 or 0, 1, but it still includes 1 and 0. Okay, then for output E, it is made of input C and D. Just need to look at these two rows. It's an AND gate. So for 1, 1, it's going to produce 0. Then 1, 0, it's 1. Then 0, 0, it's 1 again. Question 10 part A, figure 10.1 is a simplified top view of a flat coil. There is an alternating current AC in the coil. Describe the magnetic effect of this alternating current. If there is AC current in a coil, magnetic field will be produced, which changes its direction all the time. Part B, figure 10.2 shows a pan placed above the coil. The base of the pan is made of steel. State what quantity is induced in the base of the pan. Okay, this is an induction cooker. To make this work, EMF is induced in the base of the pan. Part C, the pan contains water. State and explain the effect of the quantity induced in part B on the temperature of the water in the pan. 
When EMF is induced here at the base of the pan, current will start flowing there, so thermal energy will be carried with the current to the base of the pan, and thus, the temperature will be increased. Question 11 Part A The isotope hydrogen 1 has a proton number of 1 and a nuclear number of 1. Two isotopes of helium are helium-3 and helium-4. Helium-3 has a proton number of 3 and a nuclear number of 3. Helium-4 has a nuclear number of 4. Complete Table 11.1 for neutral atoms of these isotopes of helium. One thing to take note is that a nuclear number is made of a number of protons and neutrons. It's given that helium has 2 protons and a nuclear number of 3, so the number of neutrons will be 1. Also, these are neutral atoms, so the number of protons should equal to the number of electrons, so it's also going to be 2 for helium-3. Then the mass compared to a neutral atom of hydrogen-1. The nuclear number of hydrogen-1 is 1, and for helium-3, it's 3. You don't need a unit for that, we don't learn that here, just write 2 more, because there are 2 more nuclear number. Then same thing for helium-4, it has a nuclear number of 4, well, these are isotopes, so the number of electrons stay the same, 2, and the number of protons stay the same as well, so it's 2. But the nuclear number is 4, so 4 minus 2, it's 2. And since its nuclear number is 4, compared to the hydrogen 1 where the nuclear number is 1, you can write that it's 3 more. Part B. An experiment takes place in a laboratory shielded from all background radiation. A sample of radioactive material is wrapped in aluminum foil of thickness 0.1 mm. A detector of ionizing radiation placed 1 cm from the foil records a reading. A piece of aluminum of thickness 5 mm is placed between the detector and the foil. The detector readings drops to zero. State and explain any type of radiation passing through the aluminum foil. We have learned three types of radioactive material which are Alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha particles will be stopped by the aluminum foil of thickness 0.1 mm. Then beta rays can pass through this, but it will be stopped by the aluminum of thickness 5 mm. Lastly, for gamma rays, it will not be stopped by 0.1 mm and 5 mm. It can pass through all the aluminum foil. That's it for this video. If you've learned anything from watching this video, please like and leave a comment. It makes my day. Subscribe to get ready for your IGCSE exams. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and God bless you guys. Bye.